Okay, um, I hope that that's okay with everyone, but our Guatemala programs person is not here today. So okay. it'd be great if she can listen to our conversation. Good, and Linda, if you, I now I see you here, if you have enough of a signal and can pop in and introduce yourself, um, that'd be great. And so I think I'm on, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah, we can't see you, but we hear you. Well, you're not gonna see me because I have been working on two grant applications for our business with this COVID stuff. No, oh, yes. I don't want anybody to see me right now, <laughs> I'm pulling my hair out. Um, anybody who's ever applied for a grant knows what that feels like. Anyway, I'm Linda Gojack. Um, I think I've worked with Chad on t to t almost since it was still a dream or an idea in his head and Jen's head. Um, I'm thrilled to be a part of all of these learning labs, although I am by no means an expert. Um, I have 28 years experience um, teaching at the K-8 level. Um, I started when I was four, in case you're doing the math. <laughs> I worked at a professional development center, actually started a professional development center at John Carroll University for K-12 math and science teachers. And I worked there for 15 years. So I guess I started when I was negative four. <laughs> uh, I'm past president of NCTM, NCSM. I still do a lot of consulting, mostly in local school districts, some writing. Um, and of course, what I enjoy the most is the travel with T2T. -T. I love that. And hopefully, probably almost certainly soon to be uh, the board president for Teachers of Teachers. So that'll be exciting during a really dynamic year. So that's exciting for me. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, and I really just want to do like, what is the purpose of assessment? Um, you know, we could talk about like what it traditionally has been and then how that's progressed or what did you get out of this, this document? So I think traditionally in and I can, and Amy and I can kind of speak to where, you know, we've been as a district and I would say globally, it's probably, or not globally, but we can generalize that um, to more than just us, but we've really seen a traditional lens of it's something that I do, you know, I teach, I assess, I check it off the list, I give kids a grade is really how I think traditionally we've seen assessment start, you know, within our district and some evolution that we're trying to work through again, like Linda said, by no means are we doing anything great and perfect or wonderful, but you know, that's, that's why I would say we're traditionally, we've seen our teachers with their, um, their view of assessment. It would, and you would say like 10, 15 years ago in your school district, that's what assessment really was? I would say even like five years ago too. I mean, it's not, some people even still now think that's what, you know, but we're working and coaching through that with them. But um, yeah, I would say that is the traditional view that if you're thinking about the traditional view that we see um, with our teachers. Yeah, Paul, is that is that pretty much what you see in Ecuador when you were teaching and as a student there? Yeah, of course. Here, when we are talking about assessment, we are always, well, teachers are always thinking on, um, as a synonym of uh, grading. So whenever we are assessing, assess, how do you say that? <laughs> assessing. Uh -huh. Assessing, okay. Yeah. Then you are just grading a student and with the only purpose of uh, promoting. So that's the main idea. And reminds me once when I was uh, working at the university, at, at university here, one of the greatest university in Ecuador, and I um, had a, workshop with all of the, the teachers at the university and the, the topic was that assessment. And I started that workshop ask, uh, writing on the board one definition, saying that assessment has the only purpose of promoting students. And I asked them, well, what's wrong here? What's great here? What would we change? And I asked them if someone can raise their hand and say if they agree, totally agree, with this sentence. And I thought I, I saw most of them raise the hand. And now we're talking about teachers at the university. Mm -hmm. So what we can see in schools are almost the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. But, but um, I think this section has a much more sophisticated thought about assessment. What did you take away from that? Like, if I were to say now, what is, what is assessment? What's wrong with Paula's statement that she wrote? What would you say is wrong with that statement? 
I'm thinking about um, the purpose, like the purpose of assessment in short is to gather evidence. And then, but then what are we gathering evidence for is where the road splits. Mm. Um, and so thinking about it in the classroom, but also as we're gathering evidence about our programs for our measurement and evaluation of our effectiveness as an organization as well. And so, you know, is that evidence purely for accountability? Does this person, can this person answer these problems correctly? Does this program produce these outcomes? Or are we gathering that evidence to be able to improve what we're doing, to improve the teaching and learning, to improve the programs that ultimately imp imp will seek to improve teaching and learning in the classroom? And so thinking about it as, you know, um, even that, that gathering evidence, and Pal, maybe you can speak a little bit more about the portfolios that are happening as for assessment in Ecuador during the pandemic. And so the like the idea is really great to be collecting this evidence, but then what are they doing with the evidence is where it misses the mark um, and where there could be a lot of potential. And so recognizing that like what this innovative model of assessment has in common with some of the traditional models that our teachers are following is that there is a gathering of evidence, but maybe the way that we're thinking about doing that um, is more expansive and then what's the ultimate purpose of it? Is it to say you go on to the next grade or is it to be able to provide a higher quality education that the students are involved in the process along the way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way I read the, this article and I'm, I'm reading it through this lens, which is so you know student centric anyway, those of you who know me, it's all about student learning um, to even the detriment of probably the overall program. It's more important that the kids walk away having a real understanding of mathematics and being critical thinkers. And that's a real focus of assessment to me. It's like, how, how many different ways can I help this student know more deeply? Um, but Maria, I'm interested in your perspective because you worked at a school that, you know, was funded through grants and, and real accountability, I think. You know, that's sort of one of the the signature schools in our in our state um, and so what was the role of assessment there so just to let folks know a little bit about those north carolina school of science and math is a public boarding school and it is totally funded through the state the kids don't go to don't pay a dime to go there just the 11th and 12th graders and we draw from across the state um, in various ways in terms of congressional voting districts and trying to reach kids at, in different places um, and so it's been kind of a lab school in the sense it started in 1980, but we have a dual purpose to serve the students there, the 680 juniors and seniors who come and live there and also kind of spread what we learn there because we have a lot of resources in terms of supporting teachers. So um, we do a lot of professional development for teachers and things like that and work with the state. Um, so in terms of assessment, yeah, I think the purpose, I, I hope that when you talk to teachers at School of Science and Math, they would say that it's the purpose of assessment is to really get at students thinking and to try to build on that thinking and not kind of supplant that with your own thoughts and say, oh, you know, that's a great idea, but let me show you this other way to think about it kind of thing. Um, so the purpose, you know, we do you know, we do give grades, we have to give grades in the end, and we actually didn't use to ca calculate GPAs, but then colleges made us do GPAs. So, um, but the idea was to kind of, or is to kind of think about how our assessments can vary um, and not kind of be so pigeonholed to be just like, you know, do these, you know, five integrals and because you don't know how to do four of them, we're in big, big trouble, you know, it's more, it's, we also have, we have some traditional kinds of assessments, but we also try to ask questions about um, things like we try to do some projects once every term where the kids work for an entire week on a modeling problem. And, you know, so it's kind of trying to get at the collaboration and the communication and the presentation of mathematical ideas, oftentimes um, in a, a, some kind of a real world context. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I would say like that's a really good point in like thinking of that shift then in that evolution of looking at assessment as it's a test to it's an action. It's not a thing. It's something that you do, 
or students do um, has been like a big shift in perspective as well. Like really anything you're doing could be used as an assessment. Yeah. You could be observing students working on a problem. You could be observing discussion. Um, so it's just a shift in it moving from like a thing to an action, um, I think has been like you're describing, like just even looking at the difference in, in what that is. And when Callie was talking, I thought of when you were talking about evidence, oftentimes we do have kids reflect on their learning. And I was thinking about how how you could think about reflection as evidence, you know, whether it's reflecting on how these mathematical concepts connect to other mathematical concepts that you've learned, or, you know, how thinking through this problem, going back and thinking about the process of thinking through the problem and the problem solving process can help you build your skills as a problem solver. You know, that that's kind of interesting to me when you were talking, Kelly, I thought, oh, evidence, what about reflection as evidence? That might be kind of a cool thing to put in the bag. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know there's some some discoveries that our teachers have noticed too, and, and it has to be um, working with so many different people. Um, everybody has a different background and some teachers that have taught a really long time have a traditionalist kind of view and they're learning and kind of changing with the times because we don't know what we don't know and we, what we've all experienced in our own learning as well. Um, but I have found that it's our own mindset. And so as I see some mindsets change, then we start to, and if we're really, really strong at reflecting, then that we could get our students to do that as well and look at everything as that learning opportunities and really developing learners. Because I think if we're not reflective, we're not really thinking of ourselves as learners, it's more of that, like Kristen mentioned earlier, the traditionalist with the, oh, check, we did that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is, I know the ultimate goal, I know for me with the staff that I work for is, or work with, is how are you looking at, you know, your own views? And then is that coming through with your students? And are your students starting to be deep reflectors? And I think that's, that's ultimately where we want to get to. Yeah. Assessment as really an, an ongoing at all times gathering information process mm -hmm. that happens in lots of different ways as mm -hmm. well. Because one of the questions I had, but then Maria went and answered it sort of before that was, can it be, or, or Kristen as well, can it be a group work? Can that be an assessment? You know, can, can you even give it a group, you know, group work test, you know, where you give them problems and they have to solve it as a group. And part of the assessment is how well do they contribute to the group and, and what's their mathematics sound like? Um, so that's that's interesting, um, but that means the teacher can't talk so much, right? So, like, can a traditional teacher assess continually and ongoing? That's almost rhetorical, right? No, um, I think. And so the question is, you know, like for Kristen, you all, did you all see a shift happen when you all shifted to a different curriculum? Is that was that like the the first step or? I would say like our first step was like Amy's like you don't know what you don't know in a sense so providing experiences and opportunities to really like gain assessment literacy is kind of what you know we've we've been using like that term of assessment literacy of really understanding what is assessment mm -hmm. uh, we uh, you know initially used the language with like formative and summative assessments and really understanding the purpose of each of those and with formative being more of that frequent ongoing data collection. Once we kind of had some common language we were working from because that also makes it really hard within a system if everyone's defining something differently. So like your definition of assessment might be different than mine. And so I might be saying, hey, Chad, blah, 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 blah. But you think I'm talking about something completely different, you know, that that connection isn't there. So from like a systems perspective, we have to define in our system, what is assessment? What is formative assessment? What is summative assessment? Um, we actually kind of strayed away from the term summative assessment, and this was uh, balanced literacy or balanced assessment, sorry, balanced assessment framework that we were given from the state of Illinois, started using the term interim assessment. Mm -hmm. And what we liked about that was that it might be a larger, more traditionalist looking summative assessment, but it's not the end. It's not judgment. That's it. We're moving on. 
It's here's your an assessment that might be a little bigger, might come after a longer period of instruction, but I'm still using that information to drive my instruction and to do things with students. So we had to kind of frame our, our framework, our definition, our language first, and then build out from there. Uh, we, we chose to focus, and this was four or five, six years ago, on formative assessment first, um, and really what is that then? And then we started working with teachers on here strategies for formative assessment. Here's what it could look like. We were modeling that in the classrooms. We were encouraging conversation then about the data they were collecting within those formative assessments so that teachers were talking to one another about, well, what did you notice in your students? And then having discussions about, now what do I do with that information? Um, Cause that was another hurdle too. Like I think Kaylee maybe mentored or Callie, like they are collecting the evidence, but then they're not doing anything with it. Yeah. And so it's just like hanging out there. Like that's good to know, but like, what are you doing then with that information? Um, so yeah, sorry to ramble on, but I guess to answer your question, that first step was really then what do we, what is our common language around what assessment is that we're working from as a, as a district or a system? Yeah, that's really interesting to me because that leads me to two questions. And so I'm going to say them both because I know I'll forget the second one. Actually, I'm sort of forgetting it already. Um, oh, crap. <laughs> that's, why, <laughs> that's why, um, I mean, the first question is, you know, what, I got the, I have both. First question is, are you, you know, in, in Ecuador, even with our partners, do we see formative assessment? Is that happening? What are sort of the, some of the conditions? That, and then the second question, what, what kinds of things do teachers need to have to really do, to act on the formative assessment? I think that's, that's key, right? If I, if I don't know the mathematics myself, um, I might know that you don't know this material, but I don't know where to go from that. And so that's a, another question. How can we support teachers? So first of all, um, what do you guys see, Paul and Callie? Do you see formative assessment being used? Are we beginning to be, see that being used with the programs that we're working with? We might even talk about Galapagos and the work we're doing there. Yeah, I definitely think they do. They do, but uh, I don't think they realize they are doing that. Okay. Uh, it reminds me once when the pandemic starts and we were in the highlands here in Quito, uh, some of our partners were finishing the school year. And I remember asking when I was in the tutoring program and I asked one of my teachers and I asked, well, so what are you are going to do with evaluation? And when, since assessment in, in Spanish would be evaluation. And uh, since I asked that, she said, no, we're not going to have any evaluation this time. So I said, how you're going to end the year and have all, uh, how you're going to end this two or three months we have left without evaluation? And she said, because we're not going to have exams at the end. And I said, oh, I got it. I got it. And it reminds me what Kristen said, because um, of the we were talking about the same word, but we had totally different meanings on that. So um, I was also, well, uh, then I asked her, um, so you are not going to uh, talk with the students about the, your strengths in this th three months? So you are not going to have uh, discussions? So you're not going to listen to them? So how you're not going to have this uh, assessment in your whole this three months? And she said, no, we're going to do that. So I go, oh, you're going to do that, but you're not going to evaluate. And she said, no, because we're not going to have exams at the end. So that um, makes me think something important about having these conversations, because then we talk about what actually evolution could mean for me and what, what meant for her. And uh, I remember that I tried to use different words because the word evolution was, has so um, emotions attached fears mm. and so so things that had has been going through so many years and from her experience she she understood that uh, evaluation or assessment as something at the end and a quiz in something that you have to fear of because the the, the kind of uh, um, decisions the the teacher is going to take in based on this information then talking about evolution will change just talking the word will change the way of thinking. So she will say, no, I'm not doing this. But mm -hmm. she is. And I can see most of the teachers are doing. Maybe don't know how to and don't know too much tools. And the only way or the most or the most used way of uh, doing this will be with tests. But as the book says, we can do that with tests too. So it's not about saying tests are wrong or you shouldn't grade anything. It's about the way you are using and the kind of uh, 
decisions you are taking with this information you're gathering. So that's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, that's one of the challenges that we, we have to address on our teams in both Ecuador and Guatemala is how are we defining what assessment is and how do we talk about that in Spanish and how do we make sure that our, our partner teachers are on board and that we're, we're aligned around that. And I think that's an area where uh, our principles of effective teaching can come into play because one of the ones that we've named for ourselves as an organization is monitor learning and provide feedback. And so that gives us an opportunity, like as we flesh that out with, um, with our teachers and as that stands as one of the foundations in all of our programs, then that's something that we can explore with them and, and ensure that we are getting to a common understanding of what we're talking about and be able to then build out um, strategies and, and strengthen how that's going in the classroom. But first making sure that we're on the same page. Um, that's yes i think monitoring knowledge and what they're what they're gaining and and then providing feedback is a tough task to do especially if i'm talking a lot um what do you guys think about that it, to me it seems like you really need to be quiet as a teacher really spending energy making their thinking and knowledge visible so that i i can i can move forward from that is that something that you all see or can you do both to sort of talk a lot and monitor? Oh, I think it depends. Um, I, I mean, yeah. I, I feel like if we, and that, this is what I love when I get to go into a classroom and teach and the teacher gets to just watch students, mm -hmm. the amount of information I said, this isn't about, you know, us big people at the moment. I want you to just focus on them because in the moment of all the things that we're managing in front of students, sometimes there's things that we don't recognize. And I know I always walk away with teachers reflecting on just that. How much are they taking time to speak and own the time or giving it to kids? And I think that's been something over time that is, is something I know I've had to work on is the wait time and allowing kids opportunities to speak to each other and learning how to be a better listener. So I think it all depends and it depends on the moment, like really what you're doing, but that's what I'm recognizing anyway. I, I think it's interesting too, Chad, your question about um, Kind of monitoring that learning i think a lot of it comes down to questioning mm -hmm. right so how can we put some um kind of open-ended questions in teachers bags to say you know mm -hmm. depending on what you're teaching so here are some specific questions that you might try to kind of open the the floor to the students and then again kind of what to do next right when a student responds maybe you say, tell me more about what you're thinking, because oftentimes we hear it and we know the mathematics and we know it deeply. And so we might kind of project our own knowledge into what they're saying, as opposed to saying, oh yeah, tell me more about what you're thinking. Or, you know, I don't know, they're, they're, that seems simple, but it's, um, it takes time to kind of develop that yeah. kind of yeah. dialogue. Mm -hmm. And Even I was that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, even that strategy of being able to, to dig deeper into the, the tell me more about what you're thinking, something that Pau and I have been discussing lately too in the field is that in this transition, a lot of our, a lot of our teachers don't have a very deep level of content knowledge about what they're teaching. And so then when they begin to get excited about like, okay, I need to ask questions and I need to have student voice in my classroom, they don't actually have the confidence to respond to what students are saying um and so then they just like will accept all answers mm. and just like say like um yes great next <laughs> and they don't actually address anything that's happening there and so i think being able to have tools like saying tell me more about that can even just push the students to not just throw out anything but be able to to support what they're saying. And so then the teacher doesn't necessarily have to have the most confidence in that moment about what this, if, the, if what the student is saying is mathematically 
accurate or not, but they can push for the reasoning and be able to like hear what is the student thinking about and let the student themselves actually voice that instead of the teacher in that moment feeling the need to to um, to make a judgment of like was that a valuable contribution was that was there an error in that does that make any sense like because what we tend to see teachers do is to just um, ask a question no matter what anyone says they say like excellent fantastic thank you but there's no addressing of it there and so those simple tools of then saying next step is to say tell me more about that and then other you know to continue to build the conversation um, so like listening yes and continuing like there's more to build there than just yeah. saying do you listen to students do you let them speak um, particularly when a teacher might lack the confidence in in the content to be able to respond meaningfully to what students are saying what can they ask then to be able to continue to move forward and 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 um, generate more dialogue or discourse mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in that That's moment, kind of where I was going to go. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I had to piggyback off of Kelly because I think Me it's a you, Amy. Show. Come on. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Kristen. Okay. Sorry, Kristen. <laughs> so we do this all the time. <laughs> That's exactly I'm what sure you're probably going to gonna say what I was going to say. No. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go. I was just going to talk about vulnerability. No, go. You go. You go. No, I just, I think it's making yourself vulnerable. And mm -hmm. I, and that's the thing. And, you know, we, as teachers, we're always thinking three steps ahead. Mm -hmm. And when we put ourselves out there and I'm going to put something out there that's open-ended and I don't know what I'm going to get back and I don't know how to plan three steps ahead. That's where we have to, you know, we have to become comfortable. And that's what I love when teachers watch each other or myself, or I can get in because they can see vulnerability and then maybe they'll feel a little more comfort. And I love that. Tell me more. Or I always tell students, can you prove your thinking to me? I tell them to be ready to prove their thinking. So then it's not just about, I'm just going to throw something out there. Even our little kindergartners, you know, we prove our thinking, we talk about it. And some days it's really easy to have a conversation. And some days you feel stuck yourself and what, that's just what it's all about. Mm -hmm. All right, Kristen, was that what you were going to say? <laughs> no, so good. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to bounce off of what Kelly said too with the content knowledge. I think that's another piece of all of this too is having clarity in what you are actually looking for from students because mm -hmm. you really can't assess it if you're not clear on like what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's another piece as well in, in this whole process is a teacher feeling confident and I am clear on these are, this is the thinking I'm looking for. This is the learning outcome I'm looking for and taking some time to really think through what does that look like from a learner to get from where they are now to that point to help in pinpointing, like what's the thinking I'm looking for? What's the observation I'm trying to make? Because if you're not sure, it's really hard to assess something that you're not sure of where you're trying to go in the end. So I'd say that's another kind of piece too of building in that process of clarity in the learning intentions, the learning targets, so that you know you're designing an assessment. And again, I'm using assessment very loosely. Could be a task, could be paper, pencil, could just be a question, but you're designing an assessment that allows you to get what you need to know about your student in relation to that, that learning intention or learning target. So how do we do that mm -hmm. um, if the teachers themselves don't quite had the content knowledge. I mean, the very first class I ever saw, the kids had to follow the example exactly in the book because mm -hmm. um, if not, the teacher wasn't sure that they were doing the correct math. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have an idea, but um, I want to hear your thoughts too. All right, Amy and I can kind of speak to like things we've tried or trying in our district, and this is specifically to math. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, as an instructional coach, has been very instrumental in this, in the buildings, in supporting teachers in the planning process with mm -hmm. math specifically. And we've been utilizing backwards design, UDL, whatever, you know, you want to call it, but really thinking through that three, those three steps and really thinking about um, a unit or lessons of 
your first step of really defining your learning targets or your learning intentions. And that's where a lot of that conversation comes in and in, in building the content knowledge and the understanding of the learning you're going for and what that process looks like along the way. We were noticing a lot of teachers are just like jumping quickly to assessment, like, oh, this is what the assessment says they need to learn, but not really having clarity in like what it is that they're aiming for in learning. Um, and Amy, you could probably talk way more about this because you've been the one like on the ground really doing this with teachers and it's taken time, but we found that was the way through planning to really build some of the content knowledge um, along the way. And this is a couple years coming, but it's a big, sh you know, it's a huge shift in practice and good things don't come quickly as we all know. Um, so, you know, that, that is where we started with really focusing on that backwards design process. And then the second step of that is now, how do I know if students are working towards those learning targets? And, and that would be your assessment conversation. Last, then comes instruction. So I know where I'm going. I know what I'm looking for and how I'm measuring it. Now, how do I design learning experiences to get students from point A to point B? So I know, Amy, if you want to add anything else to that, um, but that's where we are in trying to work through teachers' content knowledge, especially at the elementary level, we were noticing that's where the content knowledge maybe was was lacking a little bit more because they have to know everything. Yes. They're not just specialized. <laughs> and, and that's really, I mean, Kristen explained it beautifully. I have to, you know, from my own experience, you know, we, we, we jumped in, we're going to do this grade level planning and we, and I noticed I'm getting in teams and we couldn't really get, like Kristen said, we couldn't really talk about the instruction because we had to, we had to learn. Mm -hmm. um, there were so much about our standards that were not understood. So we started and we spent a lot of time and we were, you know, lucky enough to have a lot of, um, you know, our program coming with our math, math ed videos and things where we could really do some learning together. You know, we couldn't build success criteria. We couldn't really talk about instruction without knowing all of the content deeply. And so we spent a lot of time and every grade level was different. So we would do the learning first, exactly like she said, and then it led to deeper conversations. And then we could look at data and see student work and talk about things we collected from observations and know what to do with that information and how it could drive our next steps. Because what I was seeing was the, the teachers that were, um, that didn't have that content knowledge, they were just falling back to, I've got to just follow really what's in the program because I have to put all my trust in that program and follow what it says. And then it, then that just leads to, you know, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, test, lesson four, lesson five, lesson, you know, and so on. So. Yeah, we really wanted them to understand why they were doing, and, and we do follow, um, a curriculum program. We do, but I mean, we don't read it word for word or we encourage people not to, but they need to know why they're doing what they're doing for it to actually come, come to life. And, and we're fortunate too, that the program that we do use has a lot with building background. Um, they do have like videos on the content and like, so we have those resources at our disposal to help us with that. So like, we're not having to make that up all the time. There's a really great like research into practice part of it um, that just gives background on the content and why you're doing what you're doing. How does research support that? Um, so that's been really helpful in building that ahead of time. Um, yeah, and I mean, I know it's not necessarily assessment specific, but again, I, I will reiterate the importance of knowing where you're going to be able to assess that properly. Yeah, Maria, what are you gonna say? I was just going to ask um, Amy a question about because um, you mentioned the video. So, what is the curriculum that you're using that has these support materials? Um, we use Orgo. Say it again. Orgo. I'm sorry. Orgo. O R I G O. It's K through six. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how we met Kristen was through the CEO of Orgo. Yeah, the, and like Kristen said, there's so many things embedded, and what's beautiful about it, it's it's you know with the elementary school teachers having to know everything <laughs> we have to know we have to know everything and sometimes not masters of any because we have to know so much um it's it's a just enough you go deep enough and it's i don't want to use the word short or you know but it's it's enough where they can manage taking in that information little bits at a time and not feeling overwhelmed on top of everything else is there something like that available in ecuador or in 
in other countries, Chad, that you might have worked with that might support teachers in terms of building their content knowledge? Yes, yeah, so Oregon is, is available in Spanish. Um, so what, and, and James has offered to give us a lot of licenses uh, for free. So what we need to do is establish where that will be effective and how that will be effective. And I think that's, that was something we were working toward this year until things got changed pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll pick that up again in the, in the future, but I think that's a, that's a great, great resource. The, the, the key, one of the key components to this is collaboration, though I hear. Um, and that's something I think we need to work with in, in Ecuador and Guatemala is to get teachers to buy into the idea of collaborating. Is, would you guys agree with that? Or how was that for you, Callie, in um, uh, Hope of Bastion? Um, I have my mind started going down a, a oh no, sorry, a different path. So, for how is it going with teachers? Oh, asking, yeah, collaboration between the teachers. Between the teachers, mm -hmm. um, I think the the most common kind of collaboration that I see is let's divide this up and each person bring their piece back. Mm -hmm. Right. So that we have less work to do. And honestly, that's the same collaboration that the district I taught at in North Carolina used when we co-planned. It was like, I do this part, you do this part, and then we'll, we'll just swap. And I know for me, that was always really hard because it's very hard for me to use something that's not mine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and I, I see that when there is collaboration, often that's what it looks like. Um, but in terms of like, let's work together to build something, um, that's not as common. Mm -hmm. but, but I must say something really great about what happened with the pandemic in Hope of Bastion is that um, the pandemic forced them to use WhatsApp and dif di different ways of talking. And since they are not in the school, they need to communicate a little bit different. So I've seen that they, with, uh, with our support, when we are having these workshops, they told us that it was the first time they are sharing even emotions. We are still not in the part where they are sharing uh, about how they teach and the strategies between um, math content. They, they haven't reached it that yet, but they have started saying, oh, I'm afraid, or oh, I have problems with the kids. And then we've been realized that when they are saying or one of them just uh, encourage herself or to say something, then the, the rest are, oh my God, I'm feeling the same or oh my God, I'm having the same problems. And I think that's the first step to collaboration because they, they don't know each other, then, then how, what are they going to talk about or, or to try to, to feel that they can actually work together instead of compete. So I think that was the first step we are we're there. We've seen a change a lot in the hope of Bastion with that because they now feel feel comfortable when they are talking to each other, and that's the first step. So I think that's something great that has been help, happening in mm -hmm. the hope of Bastion. Yeah, you're spot on. That's the first step. They have to trust and have a relationship for any of that, you know, to work. So kudos to you for trying to foster that and find the silver lining in in the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, that's a way that we'll be stronger. One of the things I got from watching Linda's workshops in Galapagos and uh, working with Susan Frio was how important it is for me to be able to say, I, I, I see what you're thinking or I understand where you're going or what you're doing. And then as I was working with that, I realized that I sort of have to erase my knowledge of, mm -hmm. of what we're doing. I want to know everything that's coming into the topic. I want to know where we're all going. But that circle of what we're doing today, I sort of try to erase that knowledge and rebuild it with the students. And if I do that, that pushes me to ask these questions. Like, why is, you know, like in, in Pell Paradon, kids thought that angles always started with the ground as a parallel line, a line parallel to the ground, and nothing else can happen. And so I was able to, I even understood that because of the questions and the fact that I had erased my knowledge. Otherwise, I would just assume they understood that those both those rays were forming an angle, um, and, and that wasn't the case. They just thought one ray was forming the angle based on wherever it was to the ground. Um, and, and I think that's, that doesn't happen without saying that. The other thing that's important about sort of erasing your knowledge is that that means that sometimes the teachers doesn't have, don't have the knowledge. 
I mean, in Alperidon, again, um, I remember doing a fraction activity with the high school teachers and halfway through, one of them said, oh my gosh, four eights is the same as a half. And, you know, they're teaching high school math, but that was a discovery they had just made. Um, they knew they were equal because they memorized it, but they didn't know they were the same. And, um, and so, you know, that, that's, that's the starting point. We get them collaborating. That's a great point too, because my takeaway from today, Kristen, was how important planning is in assessment. If you haven't planned properly, um, you can adapt if you're a really quick thinker, but um, that really puts a sort of a, a handicap on where you're going. I think what you said, Chad, right now is really powerful. And we, we, when we are talk, we're working with teachers here, um, it's important for them to realize that sometimes it's okay to not know it. Yes. And, uh, because that's the first step in order to say, no, I do know and create something, invent something, or just say that the, the kid is wrong. That's the common thing. You're not doing it well because you're not doing the way I am used to do it. So realizing that is a great step. And also feeling free to say that I'm okay. And something that has also um, going on when we are working with them, when uh, teachers are uh, looking at the principals or the or us saying that as a modeling, uh, oh, that's great. I didn't thought on that, or I didn't know that. Let me check, and I'll we will talk about this later. That's something that they can see. Oh, uh, so I can not know too. <laughs> so that's great. And I think that's a great way to start because we have a lot of teachers here that does not know math very well or very deep. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to get into this all knowledge of math content when they are teaching while we're trying to them to start thinking strategies to teach. So we have to work with them both. Greatest strategies and also math content that is really, really low level levels of math content. So since we don't have the time to, to, to get it deep in the math content, we have to do it in, in, in while we are working with them. So it's great for them to say, whenever a kid is saying something you don't know, just say it. I don't know, I'll check it out and then I'll be back. And you can go back to us and say, well, this kid say this, instead of saying, oh, that's great. And even it's not, or saying, no, you're wrong. Just give a pause and say, it's okay. I don't know. Or maybe let me think a little bit harder and I'll be back. So I think that's a great tool too. Yeah, I love that. Powerful for the kids too. Think about that to go, oh my gosh, I helped my teacher learn this thing. That's awesome. Because they start to learn that their knowledge is powerful and valuable. I, I want to shift just a bit because I read in this section that it's not only about understanding the student thinking and and I'm gonna say helping them deepen their learning, but it's also about assessment is about evaluating the system. And that's the teacher, the curriculum, and that's pretty much the two big things for the system. It might even be evaluating, certainly in our process, in our, in our context, things surrounding the students and how those are supporting learning. Um, and so what kinds of things, I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you evaluate a teacher without just looking at student test scores? Um, and how do you evaluate, is a curriculum effective? Or for Ali's sake, is our program effective if we don't say kids do this and then they do better on the test? Because that's the way people are expected. What kinds of things do we look at besides tests for that? Well, I, again, I'll speak to where, you know, when we think sure. about like teacher evaluation, um, our state does kind of dictate some components of that. And then how we do that is really up to us. But we look at both practice and student achievement as part of that with teachers and more weight is put on practice. And we have defined like here are the practices that we would consider to be effective practices for our teachers and our, our principals have been trained on what those are, what that looks like. And then they go into classrooms and they observe, it's all anecdotal, but they observe teachers in relation to these certain practices. And it's kind of like a rubric where, you know, here's what a distinguished or an excellent teacher would look like. And it goes down from there. Um, but then the principals are the ones collecting that evidence ongoing. It's not one and done, but they do it multiple times throughout the year. 
And yes, it's used as evaluation, but it's also used as a growth tool as well. So, you know, based on what we're noticing in the classroom, here's something that we can be working on together or with the coach um, that can help better what's happening in the classroom. And then identifying strengths as well um, is part of that process too. So a majority of that is done through observation aligned to specific practices that we've defined as effective teaching practices. Yeah, I wonder if there'd be any power, and I think we have, Paul, I'll get to you in a second now, sorry. Um, we have, I think the ability to do this is to have the, the teachers in the program define what those effective practices are. We can guide yeah. them, of course, sort of like you do with your class rules, right? Um, you think, what do you think about that, Paul and Kelly? You think they could do it? I, I think so. I am always in favor of believing in the potential of anyone that I'm working with, whether that be students or teachers. And anytime I find myself saying, I don't think my teachers can do that, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so that, yes, I do think that they could, that like we have to honor the professionalism, like we have to honor that our teachers are professionals. And it doesn't matter if, you know, in Guatemala, a, a lot of the teachers have just come out of high school. Well, they're still a professional and they're doing something in the classroom. So they know something, they have something to contribute, something to offer. And they also have the brain power to be able to sit down and reflect on it and think about it and, and like come up with something that is good and, and valuable. Um, and I think that, you know, our role is to, to come alongside in that. Um, but even, you know, even in talking about like, we have our, our principles of effective teaching but they're very open and the fact that they're principles and not strategies is something that we've been talking about a lot as a team too, because, you know, then I think our job is to come in and say like, what does it look like to ensure equitable engagement in your community? Mm -hmm. And we're not mm -hmm. the ones who define that. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, you know, we can bring in examples from other places and use the research as, as a way to, to provide things to think about questions, some kinds of guidance but the definition isn't determined by us, particularly not when we're the outsiders to say that um, this, is, this is what you must do. You must use these strategies this many times. And if not, you're not doing a good job. No, how can we work together with communities so that they're the ones who are naming that based on their own goal? Like they need to agree upon these things with us and then help us to flush them out in a way is what, what is meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. The other part of that too is um, as part of the process is teachers setting personal goals for themselves as well as an educator. So based on where I am and my self-reflection, here's something that I want to work on over the course of the year and setting that goal and working with either a coach or a principal to develop a plan and really carry that out and have someone to check in and, and do that with you. So we were talking about some self-assessment with students later or earlier, but you know that applies to teachers as well. How do we help them reflect and self-assess themselves and set goals. Um, and then our job is to help support them in, in reaching those goals too. That reminds me of something that came up in after our first year of our girls STEM club. So we had five teacher leaders in a school who led alongside with me, a girls STEM club in Guayaquil. And um, something that was really interesting and that I didn't expect, but that I can kind of make sense of that came out of our teacher surveys from that is that overall, the teacher's own um, confidence about their ability in teaching math actually decreased after their first year mm -hmm. of experience in the club. And it reminds me of, mm -hmm. of what you said earlier, Kristen, about how you don't know what you don't know. And so like thinking, you know, coming into it, maybe the teachers had never had an experience before that challenged the way that they were teaching math. Mm -hmm. And so they were mm -hmm. like, this is, I have my book, I can answer these, you know, we can do this. And then after having this other experience of what it could look like, then all of a sudden their confidence was a little bit lower and thinking like, do I actually know how to answer my students' questions and guide them? Like there's this new way now. And they're, um, you know, it, I think that reflects like teachers becoming aware of, mm -hmm. of different possibilities and then being able to self-identify like 
am I doing this? And then the next step would be something that we didn't do, but that I would like to do in the future once we're able to continue again is setting those goals. What are the aspects of what you saw that you want to work towards personally and professionally? And then what's my job in supporting how, what is my role and for how do I, my job is to figure out my role in supporting them towards reaching those goals so that then their confidence can go back up, but grounded in something really meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's an interesting finding. It's, it's, it's really a finding of success for you. Mm -hmm. And you have answered yes, another comment that I was going to make. So well done, Callie. She does that pretty much once or twice every learning lab. So um, yeah. Any, any other comments about that? Because one question I have is how do we justify the cost of doing that kind of assessment to um, families, parents, administrators, politicians, um, especially if you're used to, and they're used to, uh, well, let's just give a test at the end of a chapter. They do well, that means the teacher's doing well, the curriculum's good, and the students are good. If not, we need to fix something. Um, that's a lot less expensive. I think that the students that we are seeking to serve are students that don't traditionally do well on traditional assessments. It, from my experience, you know, I, I have... I've been the teacher watching one of my students who learned so much during the school year and grew so much. And I watched her work her butt off the entire time allotted during a state assessment. And then her score came back as a one. You know, mm -hmm. it's just heartbreaking when that, when that happens. Um, and I also don't think that the answer is to just throw out the tests completely either. Mm -hmm. And I'm really encouraged when I see, like I use um, my friend Donnell Cannon as an example a lot. He is a principal in the state of North Carolina and he was, um, he's doing really innovative things in his school district in, in, in Edgecombe County, North Carolina in a rural community where um, his, I don't remember exactly what the numbers were, but when he came into that role, I think that the, proficiency of the school on the state test was like 16% or something like that. And in his first year there, he just, he really has innovative ways of sharing accountability. Like one of the pillars of their school is everybody owns everything. And so they actually revamped and rehauled the entire way that they do school based on what students and parents said. Um, and in, in their first year, they doubled their proficiency. Like that's incredible, you know, and, and if I just look at that and I say, okay, now they're at 30 something percent proficiency, that's not great, but to double and to, to move, to make that much progress on the, the tests that count for accountability, you know, and here in, in the literature as well, um, I highlighted it. Let me see if I can find it really quickly, but like using effective teaching practices and achieving success on account accountability assessments do not have to be perceived as mutually exclusive. Like students do better on these accountability um, assessments when effective instruction that includes formative assessment is, is there. That is the most effective test prep strategy. Yes, I, I think about that um, a lot too. Mm -hmm. Like who's centered, who's centered there? Is it the test itself or is it the well-being of students and, and our students have the potential to be successful against the odds when we provide the instruction that that they really need mm -hmm. that reminds me Kali, what we um the conversation we had about the galapagos conservancy and the institutes and when we have experts that really understand what math uh teaching is that um we have the problem the the big uh difference between what the teachers does in teachers do in classes and what the, the experts want them to do. And so this is so high, so different that just pretending that you should do this is not getting them to from here to here. So bringing them and saying actually they are not from zero. That's something also I do agree with Kali. We're not saying you do not know anything you do and we are gonna empower you, but you, we want you, we want us to help you to reach what you want, but sometimes they don't know what you want, what they want. So uh, 
uh, reminds me once when um, I was having a conversation with a, with a teacher and she said, I'm so mad with the children because she, she cheated on the exam and she was about to say, she, I'm going to just um, put a zero there and I wear, I'm going to fight with the mom and say she, the, the, the kid is wrong and uh, there's nothing will change my mind. And she was so furious. And I talked with her and then I, I asked, why are you furious? And what, what happened with you? And what, what, what do you want? What would be the best for her? So you want her to feel bad and do not do anything? Or what do you want? And she said, oh, well, I really want her to, to change. So do you think what, do, what you are doing will change her? Or will just say, oh, I have the zero, that's it. That's, will, that was what you are doing will change something? And she said, no. And then, so let's go back. What do you want? And asking that several times and then asking what she deeply want, then she took a different path and talked with a girl and give her the opportunity to change because that's also, we, we talk about if you're not letting them change, so does not work the, the assessment. It's all about having improvements in the education and having the children's growth. If, that's the, if the assessment does not work for that, then why is that? What is that for? So I think getting these conversations, reflective conversations with teachers and make them uh, understand what they want because it wasn't, wasn't me saying you should want this. I was actually saying to a teacher, what do you want for this kid? And why you are doing this? Then coming back is not about the grade. It's not about having this uh, problem with the mom. It's about she the, the, the student growing and learning and actually understanding what she was teaching. Yes, I like that. I like that quite a lot. Um, I, what I hear from both of you guys is, is it, it's important that the teachers have a knowledge base um, from which to begin. Because every time I visit a school in Guatemala and Ecuador, uh, frankly, in, in most places, the first the kids, first of all, are glued to the teacher. Callie, you probably noticed this, right? The classroom behavior is much more like focused in those countries than it is in the US. But every teacher says, how can I get them to pay better attention to me? And part of getting them to pay better attention is by getting them to do more, right? And, and you can't really know what, how to evaluate yourself until you know that. Because if I just came in and said, what do you want to, how, how do you know you're doing a good job? They would say, because no kid is talking and they're all staring at me. That's not, that's not a good classroom, right? So I like that you're doing it. Kristen and, and Amy and, and, and Maria, really, how do you talk to parents and, and, and politicians about assessing in a different way? You know, especially those who are really steeped in tradition and think they know what's going on. They're saying, I need to put energy and we're gonna shift into something that you, you didn't learn the way you learned, but this is what we're doing. What are some key components for that for you all? I could talk a little bit about kind of the spiel we give um, parents when they come to, to campus on Parents' Day because, you know, they know it's a special opportunity to be, to be able to go to school and they've heard already a little bit about the classes and stuff. But I, I think about kind of offering students more open-ended problems that sometimes um, they don't really know how to solve yet, right? So we use the open-ended problems as kind of an opening to oh, this is a curious thing that I really want to know about. And so to know more about it, I might need more mathematical tools in my tool bag. And that, but that can be frustrating at first, right? So kids will say to me, well, I've never done that before. And I would go, yay, that's good. You've never done that before. You know, and because they've always been given things that they've done before or somebody's done for them and kind of illustrated it for them, right? So I'd say that to the parents, I say, well, when you go to a job, do they tell you everything you have to do before they ask you to do something? And they all go, no. And then like, well, that's what we're doing here. We're kind of opening the door, getting them curious. And then they'll go, oh, wow, I need some more stuff. And it's a good day for us as teachers when our students are begging for more math, right? But it's because we've opened the door instead of teaching you everything you need to know and then asking you to do something. And also, teaching you everything you need to know and you don't know what you're learning it for is not very conducive to learning or kind of sparking curiosity. So that that tends to work over the years is to try to use that analogy of, you know, let's, let's kind of just explore things together. And as we explore things, then the learning becomes more cohesive and building of knowledge happens, so. 
Yeah, you can tell. Even Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say it's something like the experiences um, in listening to Maria talk. I, I felt like from a teacher's perspective, for some of the, our teachers to understand that we were going to change some of our approach to math instruction, it was all about, we talked about, we have to give them experiences so they can see it and feel it. Yes. And it's the same thing, you know, that she's saying with the families. And even in my own household, I'll have um, some PD going and my husband will be listening and I don't realize he's listening. And he's like, oh, I never thought of it that way. So it's just the opportunities we can get them to feel that and, and, and buy in, you know. Right. Yeah. And we do still have some like more, I don't want to say traditional, but traditional looking assessments that we give throughout the year. We have some state accountability assessments as well. I think the piece with that, that we get some pushback even from students too, is that those are always coupled with show us your thinking, explain your thinking. Like we're always trying to emphasize it's not always about the right answer, but it's also about the thinking as well. And that's probably been one of the biggest, like just from my position, I do get parents who say like, why are you asking my kid to sh share their thinking or show their thinking, but really trying to work with families on understanding the value of the thinking that goes into eventually, if you want to say getting a right answer or getting an answer, like we want to know what that process is right. um, as well. So that, you know, has been some education as well of making that shift to just, okay, we, yeah, we want to know what you would say in the end, what's your answer, but we see so much more value too in the process and that thought process behind it as well. Kristen, I think that's so, that's one of the things I wanted to mention before we get into the next phase is, um, look, if our kids, look, I would like to say that when kids are in my class, they were experiencing the best possible math class they ever could have. And it's a mm -hmm. huge drop from my class to the next one. Probably not the case, but that makes me feel good. Um, but I have to also be aware that at some point, my kids might very well get a multiple choice test or they might get a teacher that only lectures. And so I did build in lecture days, frankly, to be honest. I would like to go, today's a day, you guys are gonna lecture, we're gonna talk fast and you have to keep up. Not because that's what I think, but because you're gonna see it sometime. And you know, they'd be talking, what did you just say? I don't know. And I'd be like, can you slow down? I go, no, talk to someone else. And partly because I want them to sort of practice some of these skills and Kristen what you're saying is we do that with the traditional assessments sometimes but when we ask them to express their thinking and talk we're giving them tools so that when they see this by themselves they will do well because they don't we just assume people are going to figure that out right how many times do we just assume kids will learn how to take notes and kids will learn how to lecture recently listen to lectures and take multiple choice tests but we never talk to them about how we do it um, and mm -hmm. I think that's really valuable. Yeah. And we really like we locally can construct the assessments that I'm talking about, like our local more, you know, summative in nature assessments. And so with local control, we do, you know, we don't really have multiple choice, but you know, and what it looks like, I guess, would be more traditional. Um, but we've taken time to really talk through um a little bit different than maybe the cognitive demand you've had some conversation on, but we've talked through cognitive demand and the type of questions that are on our assessments. We've done analysis of our assessments as well of like, what, how many level one questions do we have? And what is that saying we're looking for students? And so really taking some time to analyze the assessments we were giving to our students to ensure that we do have a balance. And I don't mean like, you know, balance, balance, but that we are we have questions on our assessments that allow for students not just to show like rote procedure and memorization or instant recall of something, but there's opportunities to have real life problems that they're working through, opportunities to explain their thinking, to model something on a number line. You know, so we're really, we have really tried to, because we need to, we have to do that through our district, like, but we have control of what that looks like. So how do we analyze that and really construct something that is not just a multiple choice what's three times five mm -hmm. hey Bree, were you going to say something and i want to move to that uh, yeah i just had a question for you guys it, it sounds like you're doing some good work in terms of kind of moving the needle more towards the formative assessment ideas and um not just traditional assessments so my question is kind of like what you were asking about, Chad, is evaluating programs or curriculum or, um, you know, just the kind of the system. Are there specific things that you can 
kind of hand people numbers for because that's ultimately what people want because it's easy. Yeah, I mean, we're still, we're, we still, like I said, have more traditional like assessments that I just described. And so we are able to collect that information um, in a systematic way. We do use a digital platform to do that with um, in third grade and up. And our teachers are able to look at that, but we look at it more from like a standard lens as opposed to like, oh, they got 100% or um, our elementary schools are all standards based grading, which I think has helped a lot too, because our fifth through eighth grade is not yet. Um, we're working towards that, but they're so like, well, we need it for a grade. We need it for a grade where with our standards based grade levels, it allows us to have more conversation as it relates to like progress towards standards as opposed to like what percentage did they get. Yeah. Um, so we definitely do have things like that that we're looking at our report card because it is standards based we also do look at too um, as numbers and because we can see like I just ran like our trimester one data. How are our students doing in relation to the standards that we've instructed and assessed on and we let teachers have the freedom and flexibility to collect evidence towards that in the way that they feel will give them the most valid and reliable data. So yes, they may include some more of that like traditional assessment, but they also are including evidence from observation. They're including evidence from things that are happening through questioning in small group. That's taken a lot of time for them to see that that is valued evidence. Like we value what you're observing. We value what you see. Um, so that all goes into our report card and we can run data for that as well. And we also do have our state assessments that we look at too. And, you know, I, I don't throw that in the garbage. I think that is one piece of data in a bigger system of data. And so my questions are always like, is this in line with what we're noticing with our other assessment systems? Is it an outlier? If it is, why? Um, so we have all those pieces too. It's just a matter of, I know you hear like the triangulation of the data or looking at multiple pieces of data to really say like, what is this telling us about our programming? Um, and we're fortunate to have, you know, those different data points or those different assessment systems, but we do, we still do have, you know, the more traditional data as well. That makes me think about too, like the, the importance of having that conversation transparently with mm -hmm. both teachers and teachers with their students and like these, what am I modeling value in as mm -hmm. assessment? And because it wasn't helpful for my students if I put all of my weight behind the state tests. Um, and it also wasn't true or helpful for them if I said they don't matter at all. And mm -hmm. so it was talking about like, you know, this is one number and it is not a number that defines you. This is why this exists and we have to do it. And so we're gonna do the best that we can and it's not everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that, but that was something that I definitely saw because uh, my district was being taken over by the state um, when I started teaching because we were really, really struggling. Um, and so everything was about the accountability assessments mm -hmm. and it just created so much stress. And then I taught a three, four transition class, which were kids who didn't pass the third grade standards. And so they had to do third and fourth grade at the same time um, with me. And it was horrible because they spent their whole year in third grade, they had like, it's a whole lot of opportunities to demonstrate proficiency on the standards, but it's in ways that all felt high stakes and stressful and painful for them. And so they came to me completely traumatized as nine-year-olds. And it was, I mean, it, it was horrible. And so one of my main goals was to help them see that like, this doesn't define you. I can put a reading passage in front of you because that was all based on reading standards at the time. And you know, we can read together and have fun with reading and you can, you can grow in this and like, nope, unfortunately we had these portfolios where they had, there were 12 standards that they had to demonstrate proficiency on and on like 80% of this. And they had to have three to five passages that they passed for each standard. I mean, it's just a ridiculous amount of like multiple choice work for really young kids. And they had failed the portfolios and the state tests and then the state retest and then the read to achieve test the year before. And so then they had to do it all over again. And so there was really a, like, we couldn't throw it out. It had to matter for them, but there was like, they needed to see from me, like what that was for. And um, that that wasn't the, the only thing that we were looking at. Um, and that I think 
is something that we can model for the teachers that we work with and that, that then they can model for students. Because here in Ecuador too, there's very high stakes tests. Like the, the Ser Bachiller test that students take when they graduate high school determines if you can go to a public university for free or right. not. Um, and which ones you can go to. And not only that, but which majors can you choose? And so like, that's one test that determines the rest of your life, basically. And, um, you know, we can't just throw that out and we can't ignore it. But also, we can demonstrate that, like a different attitude towards those kinds of assessments. Mm -hmm. I want to say something. It reminds me one activity I did with the teachers at the university once when we were trying to define evaluation and uh, ask them these questions. What evaluate? When evaluate? Which tools we, we use to evaluate? In to whom we are evaluating? evaluating who evaluates? These questions and ask them, well, what's tradition for them? And then we, we did that kind of zoom out because we were looking at it's okay to evaluate students. It's not is not that is wrong and we should just throw that to the trash. It's not about that, but we should look different angles. And then we talk about when, what, what evaluate and we are talking about uh, content. And then we, we just did this kind of zoom out saying, well, content is okay, but it's not the only thing we're looking for. We are also talking about um, competencias. Competence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we talk about abilities and we talk about attitudes. So we talk about a lot of things when we talk about uh, with which tools we can use. And they say, well, homeworks and tests. And it's okay to have in homeworks and tests, but let's look at different angles too. Let's zoom out a little bit more and, and look at the observation tools and rubrics and, and projects and, and different different tools to evaluate. And then we talk about it. To who who is evaluating? And they said teachers. Teachers are the only one to will evaluate. And they said, it's okay for teachers to evaluate. But what about asking themselves to evaluate? So we were talking about auto evaluation. And then what about uh, asking other students to evaluate to to the pairs? So we're talking about co evaluation. So we talk about this kind of zoom out when we're talking about what traditional evaluation would be in going out and say who is evaluating, to whom we're evaluating, when? Because they, they think, well, it's good to evaluate at the end of the period. And that's okay to have an evolution at the end. But what about in the middle? And what about in the, in the whole like a, a continuous process? So talking about that or um, building things around what they already have was uh, easier for them instead of saying, what you're doing is totally wrong. We can build from what you're doing. It's okay. But let's look a little bit. Uh, Let's give a, a step back and see what, what else we can do. Yeah. So um, since we have we have about 10 minutes left or nine now, um, and one of the things I, I had fun with my end of chapter test, basically my sort of summatives, and they became more than just that. And, um, and then we've worked with um, some of our partners, Have one of our partners in particular um, said, we need our kids to do well on the multiple choice test, just period, that's it. And, and that's the thing we want to focus on. And so I was trying to think about how we can help them do that. And we came, I came up with some strategies for taking or presenting tests that are, I think, different, that maybe make them, that give more information or make them a learning, mostly make them a learning opportunity for the students. And so I also, maybe you all have some things too, like here's what things we do on tests. So I thought I'd offer a couple ideas and then throw some things out for you all and hear your feedback too, if you guys are good with that. Um, one thing is for the partner with the multiple choice test, um, I think we can make those number talks. That's what I used to do in, in my class. So, you know, when we take a test, so it's fine to give, you know, let's just do this problem and there's five options and then let the kids work on it, but not tell me the answer C, but talk through the entire thinking process. Because to be honest, on some multiple choice tests, you don't need to know the math between that they're looking for. If you know other math tricks, oh, I know you've done this, right? They go, I don't. I just know the factors are going to be positive, and these are the only two factors that are positive. So I'm going to choose this one. Um, so what are those tricks, and how do why do why are those tricks work? I think there's real power in the talking about that and having other people in the class understand. Is that something you guys have ever thought about or or done? Be interesting to do research on it. Amy could probably speak a lot about number talks because that's something I know she does a lot with teachers. Yeah. 
sorry, Amy, to put you on the spot. But. No, I mean, I mean, I feel like it's not, I feel like the number talk piece is what leads to what you're speaking about, Chad, yeah, honestly, exactly. in mm -hmm. being able to justify what it what would be incorrect and why and what would be correct. So I feel like that just builds up their ability to be able to reason. Mm -hmm. So if I'm addressing that, that, that's just the way that I'm viewing it. I feel like I feel like there's data that I'm taking in the moment when I'm listening to kids and that's helping me to think about my next steps in instruction. But then I know that if I ask a student and I'm assessing them through a multiple choice question, and I'm asking them to justify, then I know that that's something and I know I'm going to have to have them do, then that would be a piece that I would work into the number talk yeah. opportunity mm -hmm. for sure. And it's so powerful. So another thing I would do is um, after giving, taking the test and grading them, I give the entire class a blank test with their score. No one ever ever get a hundred or if they get a hundred, I, I talk to them. But then um, I would, their task would be to turn in perfect tests. And so they could talk to each other. And that was really interesting because then we'd have debates because someone would go, I got a 94, I think I got it right. And the person would go, no, I'm sure my answer is right on this one. And then they'd be talking about why it was right. So on the one hand, they're, they're assessing their own knowledge and evaluating what other people say. So I thought that was a pretty fun um, way of reviewing tests as opposed to me going, oh, the answer to number five is you know, 22.3. Um, so that's something that I did in my classes. That was sort of fun. I was what? one of the things that we did because we had like benchmarks that we were able to, to use um, that were similar to the state test that came from a, a contracted agency, but we could use them for instruction afterwards. And so one of the things that my students would have to do in groups was not explain um, what, which one was correct sometimes on a question that gave us trouble, but be able to come up together with why it couldn't, why it shouldn't be the other answers. Um, because that just in multiple choice constantly got them really mixed up into like, there's several that it appears that it could be. And so which is the one, like which is the one that doesn't have a, well, it can't be this because and so they would kind of just think about it that way and like disproving the other ones. And that was one that generated a lot of discussion and also went towards like, not so much, can you get the right answer, but can you think about like, why would it not be this? Can you disprove the other ones instead? Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that even makes me think of like, why might someone choose this one? Like what yeah. in their thought process would make them gravitate to that, even though it's not the right answer, let's say, but like, why might someone lean towards that one i like that that's a really good yeah it's yeah. the same kind of thing mm -hmm. i've been thinking like good test takers think one of oh. the hardest courses i took when i was at the university studying math was one that uh, made i had a group discussion and i had questions and multiple choice and i have to ponder saying if it will be uh, an answer that the students will take and how much will like uh, the percentage will be around the, the answers because you, you're thinking this is totally an outlier. So will be the one that everyone will say this is not. So how much will you ponder that question and with trying to define this is probably the right, but which is the others that will be other students take and try to make uh, this in percentages was really fun and hard because to have mm -hmm. this kind of conversations, math com conversations around how you how a student will get to this answer if it's wrong but how will they get to this answer which kind of questions uh, will, which kind of mistakes will they make and what kind of mistakes are this is just a simple arithmetic calculus mistake or is something about the, the the conception or the everything about the math so it was really hard and is about what you're saying trying to to define which is the best and which is not the best but a possible answer Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're defining. About, oh, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Kristen. I just had a quick question about the assessments that the students are expected to take, like either from the state, county, however, you know, that structured the town. Are they 
somewhat connected to what the teachers are teaching like in the classrooms or are they finding like the skills or knowledge needed on the assessments are very different than what they're doing in the classroom because I could see that being really difficult too like you're trying really hard to do this but then when it comes to testing they're expected to do this is there somewhat of a connection or is it two completely different realms How maybe you can correct me if you know something differently, but from the elementary schools that I have worked most closely with here in Ecuador, the teachers actually create their exams. There's not like a state exam until the very okay. end of high school, which okay. is um, almost worse when it comes to the high stakes of that exam because they've never had any practice with it. And then that one in particular, high schools in Ecuador um, in the past and some of them still continue to be were specialized and so like this school might be labeled um like a science school and this one has uh or so sometimes the schools can have specific categories but then also students choose their like path of study and so you graduate high school with like a specialty in accounting or whatever that might be um but now that the exam required in for to go to university includes all of the topics but students didn't study all of the topics they specialized in just a few and so that like it's one that's very strongly critiqued um and because it just doesn't like it is not a fair mm -hmm. assessment in any kind of way but from the year to year from my understanding teachers are the ones who create their the exams the traditional exams for their students okay, okay. but where they took those exams most of the times are just uh, copying the same example from the books because they do have books. So that when they are trying to, to evaluate or, or um, give a grade, they just took in this, they are just taking the, the same example, the same exercise, changing the numbers. Mm -hmm. so that's the common way of, a, of a making exams, mm -hmm. your own exams. And then they have to use like multiple choice as the answer type. Well, they, they can decide that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, there's actually a lot of potential in the system in Ecuador, like in the mm -hmm. moment. And then it just mm -hmm. leads up to that horrible test at the end of, yeah. of high school. Um, but okay. even the way the Ecuadorian curriculum is that you have the standards and then you have the, um, they're like indicators for success that show how you might evaluate that, um, which I think is a really strong tool, but I've never seen teachers like put those together and do much more than like just name it based on the page that they're working in in their book. It's really strong. Hey guys, um, time is almost up. Maria, you want to say something quickly? No, and, I had a question, but that's fine. We'll get answered. Yeah, I love these discussions. I hope you guys um, have enjoyed it as well. And I wish these were longer, um, but but we have years to do this, so we can re revisit this because we just, just touched assessment. Um, thank you guys so much. Any comments or thoughts or anything before we wrap up or questions? Thanks for the conversation. I have a lot of things that I'm thinking about now and even and thinking about big picture and our programs and um, all of that. So definitely thank you for all the thoughts, everyone. I yeah. echo that. Thank you so much. Thanks for including us. We learned, I personally, I don't want to for Amy, but learned a lot too. I, I love the opportunity just to kind of talk through things like in a think tank kind of way and hear from each other and what's working and not working in other places and being able to take a few little nuggets back is, is awesome. So thank you. Definitely hearing what's going on around the world is, is <laughs> very interesting. I love professional conversations, period. So thank you for having me. Yeah, and it's good great. to know we're not alone in our struggles too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's always nice to know. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah I'd love to have your... that's when we bring them in to have these conversations, you know, for teachers to, to be able to say me too with someone yeah. else. You know, they, they <laughs> I think it's terrible too when I was thinking about like when I actually was in Ecuador or um, in Guatemala to talk to the teachers about how the fact that all over the world people are facing these problems. Yeah. Yeah. That, you're not, not only are you not alone because other people in your area are facing these, but everybody's having these conversations because we want to make learning better. Better. Mm -hmm. And um, around the world, 
we all seem to learn from Europe in the colonial times. It seems like that every classroom is line up in rows and teach. And now we're making adjustments away from that. So, um, but you know, um, Amy, for sure, share your contact information with us or if, if Kristen can make a connection, um, then I'll connect you with our team. Because one, if we have questions, I'd love for them to be able to ask you. Um, and at some point when it's safe to travel and do things, um, come do things with us, that would be that would be exciting. I know it's a pretty rewarding trip for us and hopefully it would be for you all too. So thank you all so much for doing this. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye.